So I just want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak today, and hopefully my talk warms you guys up in this chilly auditorium. Um, so my name is Ian Watson. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Uh, Linda Chin's lab, helping lead the melanoma TCGA analysis, uh, which is co-chaired by uh, Dr. Linda Chin and Jeffrey Gershenwald. And I just wanted to put up all the author or all the people responsible for the different platforms. Uh, this is quite a, uh, like many TCJ projects, a very collaborative effort. In particular, I want to point out the efforts from Li Wazu and Terence Wu, who are data and analysis coordinators. And also thank the Firehose team. Uh, our point people have been Dan Dakara and Mike Noble for all the custom adjustments they've made uh, to Firehose, given that uh, the Melanoma TCJ project is different from every other TCJ project to date in that over 80% of our samples are from metastatic origins. Uh, they originate from non-glabrous skin primaries, so that's the uh, hair-bearing parts of your uh, skin. Uh, we've excluded samples from the palms of the soles and, um, or sorry, the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, as we know that they have different genetics from past studies. Another criteria was no prior systemic treatment. And the rationale for this is that with primaries, they're very small, they tend to be nevi, uh, so you don't get a lot of tissue uh, in order to carry out all the different uh, analysis for the TCJ project. And most of those samples goes for diagnostics. Also, if discovered early, melanoma is highly curable. However, the survival rate uh, decreases significantly uh, for regional disease. And what we're studying here is the most common first site of metastasis in melanoma. So the majority of our samples are from the regional lymph nodes as well as regional skin and soft tissue. We also do have a good number of primary and distant metastatic samples, which will allow for some unique TCJ analysis in the future. However, I should note that there are only two cases with matched primary and metastatic samples. Uh, we stopped the uh, data freeze at batch 291. Um, we have up to 330 samples for a given platform, and uh, the rate limiting platforms for the integrative analysis, like many TCJ studies, are the RPPA and low pass whole genome sequencing. So we know that melanoma has the highest mutation rate of any uh, cancer to date, and UV plays a significant role, as demonstrated this ni nice figure from Mike Lawrence and Gad Getz, uh, showing the comparison of the mutation rates for across all cancers. Uh, we confirmed this result in that uh, we observe a mutation rate of 17 mutations per megabase, which I think is the highest reported for any TCGA cancer to date. The majority of the mutations are C to T transitions at dipyrimidines, which is cons consistent with the role of UV-induced uh, DNA damage and misrepair. We are left with the problem of identifying uh, driver mutations when we've identified over 200,000 single nucleotide variants in our up to 300 samples. So how are we going to address this? Well, first we turned to MuteSig and we identified 42 significantly mutated genes with a Q value of less than 0 0.1. We also used INVEX, which is a statistical tool which also takes into consideration intronic mutations to try to determine a gene-specific background mutation rate and uh, has been used in past studies at the Broad Institute in a collaboration with Linda Chin, Levi Garraway, uh, a talented computational biologist, Iran Hodis, and myself in a previous analysis of exome sequencing data for melanoma and was used in a really nice study by Matthew Meyerson in another high mutation rate cancer. So what do our significantly mutated genes look like? We identified 13 significantly mutated genes by INVEX, and these 13 were, uh, genes were also found on the MUTSIG list. What gives us confidence in this list is we identify the known melanoma drivers, such as BRAF, NRAS, CDKN2A, P53, and P10. We also identify significantly mutated genes that have been found in a few exome sequencing studies, including PPV6C, ARID2, MAP2K1, and RAC1. We also identify for the first time sig to be significantly mutated melanoma-associated genes, uh, NF1, uh, IDH1, and RB1. So they've been implicated in melanoma, but here we find the first time to be significantly mutated given our large sample set. And we identif identify a novel gene, DDX3X, which is a RNA helicase. So this is our landscape figure. You can see the mutation rate at the top. The samples are indicated in the columns. We see uh, the uh, mutation spectrum below, and as you can see, the majority of the samples do have a high fraction of CDT transition, in indicated of a role of UV. One thing that's clear from the, uh, from the uh, landscape is that we do see a high fraction of BRAF hotspot mutations, which is known. A majority of them occur at the V600 residue. Um, these are mutually exclusive with hotspot mutations in NRAS, 
and the major majority of them occur um, at the Q61 residue. So one of the major questions in the field is what's driving these BRAF, NRAS wild type samples? And for the first time, we've sequenced enough uh, samples to really get an idea of the landscape of mutation in this subset. One thing I want you to notice is that these uh, BRAF, NRAS wild type uh, have a higher fraction of samples that lack the UV signature. And in the samples that have the UV signature, we see an accumulation of these NF1 loss of function mutations. So the BRAF hotspot and NRAS, NRAS mutations are uh, significantly anti-correlated, but also the BRAF hotspot and NF1 mutations are significantly anti-correlated. So we only observe one uh, co-occurring loss of function NF1 mutation with a hotspot BRAF mutation. So what do these NF1 mutations look like? Over 50% over of the mutations are loss of function mutations, either nonsense splice site or frame shift deletions. When the NF1 mutations and the BRAF mutations do co-occur, they tend to co-occur with these uh, exon 11 BRAF mutations, which are weaker kinase activating mutations. Based on the relationship of these MAP kinase driver mutations, we suggest that melanoma can be categorized into four genetic subtypes, which include the BRAF hotspot mutations, the RAS hotspot mutations, as we do identify a few H and K RAS hotspot mutations that are anti-correlated with the uh, NRAS mutations. Uh, NF1 mutations, which tend to be loss of function mutations in these uh, triple wild type samples. So what's driving these triple wild type sam uh, samples? So by incorporating other data platforms, it becomes more clear. So again, based on our sample size, we're now able to do this type of analysis where we perform gistic 2 analysis on the different subtypes. So we know MIDF, which is a lineage-specific oncogene, is significant amplified in uh, melanoma, but we only found, find this significant application in the BRAF hotspot mutant samples, and same with the BRAF uh, uh, amplicon. We only find that in the BRAF hotspot mutants. When we look at the NRAS hotspot mutants, uh, Andy Cherniak identified a minimal common region that also includes NRAS. And what you see in the triple wild type is you see this 4Q12 amplicon, which is only found to be significant in the triple wild type, and that contains KIT, uh, KDR, which is also known as VEGF receptors 2, uh, and PDGR alpha. We also observe significant applications in TERT, cyclin D1, and this 12Q15 region often includes MDM2 and CDK4. So when we include these copy number alterations in the landscape, we start to fill out what's driving this particular subtype of melanoma, as we can see the, the different uh, significant applications. We also have observed some cosmic mutations in known melanoma drivers, such as GNAQ, GNA11, and KIT. And this is just another representation of, of the uh, distribution of these uh, ampl amplicons, and you can see that they're enriched in the triple wild type. We also performed fusion analysis in a, uh, in a collaboration with the, uh, the Harvard Medical School Brigham Women's and MD Anderson Cancer uh, Genome Characterization Center, uh, where we performed low-pass whole genome sequencing. We also incorporated deep whole genome sequencing, as well as RNA-seq using multiple callers. I won't go into this entire uh, pipeline, but on poster number 63, there's a description of this entire approach. We identified 221 potential drivers, and I'm just going to highlight uh, Two. So uh, these are the BRAF fusions um, that were identified. Recently in the literature, they've been estimated to occur in a, a relatively high fraction. However, we only see them occur in about, or we only find two of them within all our samples. Uh, what's interesting is, the, is one of the fusions was, only, was found in the triple wild type, and the other one we don't have overlapping exome data. So these are all MAP kinase driver mutations. Do they have uh, similar signaling outputs? Um, we looked at uh, downstream signaling, so phospho-MEC, and interestingly, we only saw comparatively elevated levels of phospho-MEC in the BRAF and NRAS mutant samples, and only uh, uh, comparatively ele elevated levels of phospho uh, erc in the NRAS mutant samples, and we're currently trying to decipher some of the signaling pathways involved in this through our integrative analysis. So what are some of the other interesting mutations we're identifying? So we identified this hotspot uh, IDH1 mutations. And unlike the GBM mutation, it's not the R132H, it's the R132C mutation, which is caused by uh, C to T transitions, so presumably UV damage. Uh, the John Hopkins group performed clustering analysis of our methylation data, and uh, they've identified this uh, high simp group. Um, and interestingly, the IDH1 mutations clustered with this high simp group as well as ARID2. Um, this high simp group also had less uh, BRAF mutations. 
And one of the issues with our clustering analysis is because we have metastatic samples from all different origins, often they're a reflection in terms of our clustering subgroups of the uh, origin of where the tissue was procured. However, in this particular analysis, we did not find that relationship. Another thing that's interesting about this is the GBM uh, HISIM group is often associated, and the IDH1 mutations are often associated with better survival. In our um, analysis, they are trending towards worse survival. Uh, one of the unique aspects of the TCJ project, too, is how we, how we do our survival analysis. Because um, we are uh, acquiring the metastatic sample and not the primary sample, we are doing both overall survival as well as this TCJ survival. And this is from when the sample was procured to the days to last follow-up and death. So this is how we're doing our survival analysis for the metastatic samples. When we performed the RNA-seq group, our RNA-seq clustering analysis, we identified three subgroups. But as I mentioned before, they were often a reflection of the sample where they were procured. So for example, uh, we identified this lymphocytic immune signature score uh, or subgroup, which was uh, found to be enriched in the uh, regional lymph nodes. We also identified a keratin or epithelial cluster, which was enriched in the uh, primary samples, as well as a subgroup that was identified or that was distinguished by low mid-F and low mid-F signaling, which is a lineage-specific oncogene. Interestingly, though, the uh, high uh, lymphocytic group or immune group actually had the best uh, survival, and this is consistent with other uh, studies that have um, been found in both in many different tumor types as well as melanoma. And this is in particular important given that the immune therapies have had a major impact for uh, metastatic patients. So we, we dug deeper into this and uh, we had our pathology team, which was le uh, led by Richard Scullier, actually look at the samples and score for lymphocytic infiltration. So they're scored from uh, low to high and you can see that there is distribution across the samples of low to high and even within the lymph nodes there are samples with low lymphocytic infiltration. And when you look at the survival, you do see that the, uh, the uh, patients with, with samples that have high lymphocytic infiltration do, uh, do better. And even when you just consider this uh, only the regional lymph node samples, and again, this is important in the, in the context of the new immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, uh, targeted therapies for the immune system and melanoma. Uh, one of the other uh, important findings that have recently come out of literature in terms of melanoma genomics is these TERP promoter mutations um, that Matthew was asking about yesterday. So um, we, we do not capture the TERP promoter mutation, obviously, in our exome sequencing data. However, the Harvard Brigham Women's MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, Genome Characterization Center performed the uh, PCR and Sanger sequencing on the uh, over 100 samples in which they also did low-pass whole genome sequencing. And we observed that the TERP promoter mutations occur at a similar frequency that was report, reported in the literature, about uh, 60 to 65 percent, and that these two mutations were mutually exclusive. Um, the, the, going back to uh, Matthew's question yesterday, we found only that the C228 uh, T mutation was associated with increased expression. However, again, we're only looking at 100 or so samples. Another uh, preliminary analysis that we did observe was that the, um, the metastatic samples tended to have a higher fraction of samples that had this TERP promoter mutation. Here's just a high-level overview of the uh, pathways altered in melanoma. This is performed by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group, um, and by Chris Sander and Anil. And, um, we're, what we're demonstrating here is the, in, this, in, in our study is this new uh, MAPK driver melanoma, NF1, found to be significantly mutated. Uh, these are the four genetic subtypes, and as I uh, pointed out through, through the course of the presentation, we're finding certain driver events that are found in, in certain subtypes. For, so for example, the triple wild type driven by MDM2 amplification, cyclin D1, CDK4, TERT, and KIT. We also identify some uh, significantly mutated mutated genes that are associated with particular drivers that I didn't get a chance to go into, uh, which include PP6C, for example, for the BRAF and NRAS mutants. And this is becoming clear in our Oncosign analysis, which I don't have time to show you today. So in summary, uh, we've identified four genetically distinct uh, melanoma subgroups, uh, which include the BRAF hotspot, uh, RAS hotspot, NF1 loss of function, and triple wild type. Integrating these platforms, we show that they, they do not uh, signal similarly through the MAP kinase pathway, and so each of these mutations does have uh, different MAP kinase signaling. We also identified the IDH1 uh, hotspot mutation, and it clusters with the uh, high simp group. 
And some of the analysis that unfortunately I wasn't able to show you today was the incorporation of the oncosign, uh, the microRNA clustering analysis, as well as some of the primary versus metastatic comparative analysis that we've done, uh, as well as one of the main uh, aspects of our project that we're kind of continuing with is the genetic determinants of this uh, lymphocytic infiltration. So on that note, I just want to thank everyone on the manuscript writing committee that uh, is involved in trying to put together this marker paper. I want to thank the uh, fire hose bro or the Broad Fire Hose team that have helped with all the uh, platform specific analysis. And as of April, uh, this is all the authors contributing to the project. So thank you for your time and thank you to organizers for giving a chance to speak today. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, the triple well type group is very interesting. Uh, apparently, the mutation rate is l lower in that group. So are they associated with lower in lymphocyte infiltration? And that will infer that because most of these are the uni damage and the lung cancer, they are generally neoantigens. Yes. So I'm wondering whether there's any correlation. The other question is, for example, that triple wild type apparently is using different set of RTKs, and those yes. are KET, PDGF. Those likely will respond to sunitinib or kinds of RTK drugs have do you have any data for that? Uh, I don't have any data for that. And I know people at MD Anderson and uh, a few other groups are looking into that. In terms of your question about the lymphocytic infiltration and the triple wild type, I do not think that there was an association in that case. I think it is due to the fact that they have a, a lower mutation rate. Uh, but that is a good question. And I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and get back to you. Uh, regarding the triple wild type, uh, since they don't seem to have a UV signature, did you look for some other type of signatures in those samples? Mm -hmm. And did you look also in the, maybe in the germline to find out the DNA repair genes would be affected? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we're, we, we are doing those analysis, and we have looked at the, um, the mutation signatures that Michael Stratton identified. Um, and uh, we also looked at chromothripsis, and um, depending on the chromothripsis color you use, we did see some enrichment in the triple wild type samples. Um, however, these seem to be complex rearrangements, not your classical uh, chromothripsis. Um, so that, that is one potential aspect of what's happening in, in, in these uh, triple wild type sam samples in terms of uh, genetic signatures. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we're, we're, we'll hear from uh, Rehan Akbani from MD Anderson on the pan-cancer proteomics landscape of the Cancer Genome Atlas projects. 